Hello, I'm Dennis Pullis. Welcome to another Open Philosophy video. In this video, we'll be continuing our discussion of knowledge. I began this series by showing that, contrary to popular philosophical opinion, knowledge is not a form of belief. Then I went on to discuss a number of projections of knowledge. In the last three videos, I've discussed knowledge as a human experience, as a relationship, and as a sign. In this video, we'll be considering knowledge as causally engendered. That is, we'll be looking at the dynamics that let us have knowledge. In the last two videos, I've criticized John Locke for saying that all we know is our own ideas, when, in fact, our ideas are simply the means by which we know reality. Yet there is some truth behind what John Locke said. What we know is mediated by representations in our brains, and so the forms of those representations can affect how we know reality. Because of crossed wiring in their brains, synesthetes see sounds, smell colors, or hear textures. For example, most people would have to go through a field of random numbers, digit by digit, seeking out, for example, a five. But to a synesthete, all of the fives might appear red and so stand out immediately. So the problem here is that what we know is what is represented in our brain state. And what we need to know in order to know an object is the object itself. So how is it that we can know objects when what we know depends on our brain state? Last time, in discussing the idea of meaning or reference, I showed how the object's radiance of action, what the scholastics called its sensible species, penetrated us and allowed the idea to form. Now let's consider this same thing from a more metaphysical point of view. When we see an apple, light scattering from it acts on our retina to modify it and form an image. The question is, what does this image belong to? Well, in one sense, it's the apple's image. It's the act of the apple on us as a perceiver. But in another sense, it's our image. It is our retina being modified by the apple. What we have here is a case of shared existence. The image belongs both to us and to the apple. It is what I like to call existential penetration. The apple has existentially penetrated it, and part of its being has become part of our being. In the same way, as we follow the apple's radiance of action onward, we see that the image which is formed in the retina goes on to form an image in our brain. The image in our brain is another case of existential penetration. So the brain's representation of the apple is not something which belongs to us alone, but is something which is shared by the apple. It is the apple's action on us. It is the apple's presence in us. So when we become aware of the apple's action on us, we are aware of the apple itself, not merely of our brain state. In fact, if you think about it, we're not aware of our brain state at all. Our brain state consists of connections that exist between the various neurons and pulses which signal information. We are aware of neither. What we are aware of is the sensations caused by the apple. Aristotle gave us a different projection of this shared existence of the identity of sensed and sensor in the act of sensation. In Aristotle's formulation, there are two potencies, two potentials. One is the object's sensibility, its power to produce a sensation, and the other is the organism's ability to sense. As potential, neither is fully operational, neither is fully existent. Both of these are merely potential until the act of sensation, when one act completes both potencies, making them actual. Thus we see once again that in sensation, subject and object are not separate, but share a common actuality, a common reality, a common existence. What 
what we've been talking about so far is sense knowledge. There's another level of knowledge, true knowledge, being aware of what it is that we sense. We've all had the experience of sensing but not being aware of what we've sensed. For example, I can drive safely and think about something or be involved in a conversation. And while I'm driving safely, I miss the exit that I'm intending to go to because I'm on automatic pilot and driving to some customary destination. It's only when we're paying attention, when we're aware, that we're forming ideas. What happens in the formation of ideas is that the data which was intelligible in our sensations now becomes actually known, actually understood. Again, we have the same thing that we had in sensation, the actualization of two potencies in a single act. The object that was intelligible, that was potentially understandable, is now actually understood. And my ability to understand, which was potential, is now in operation and I actually do understand. And it is the same act, this one act of understanding the intelligible which actualizes both potencies. So again we have a case of shared existence. The intelligibility of the object, which belongs to the object, becomes elevated to my understanding of the object this is another case of existential penetration. The content of the idea belongs to the object, but the awareness of the idea belongs to me. So the idea is both partially the object's and partially mine. One and the same reality belongs to two different things, the object and the subject. And so the idea makes the object present to my mind. In grasping the idea, I grasp the object which causes it. Since we have a different outcome, there's different dynamics involved here. The causality which takes the sensible and makes it actually sensed is not the same causal dynamics that takes the intelligible and makes it actually understood. So there's two levels of actualization here. One is making the sensible sensed, and that is a physical process. And the other is making the intelligible understood, and that is an intentional process. Virtually everything about sensation can be explained physically in terms of our neurophysiology. On the other hand, neuroscientists have no explanation whatsoever for the fact that we are aware of some of what we sense. Thus we have two levels of causality, one which is physical and is completely adequate to explaining our sensations, and the other which is intentional and deals with our awareness and which is a complete mystery to neurophysiologists. This is reflected in my model of the two subsystem mind, a model I outlined in video number 21 and elaborated in video number 22 on the mind-body problem. We can now see how the two subsystem mind model coordinates with the data on sensation and knowing. Now I want to talk a little bit about identity theory. Identity theory is the theory that most naturalists hold. In it, ideas are identically brain states. There is one representation which is in the brain, and that is what an idea is, the representation in the brain. The theory that I'm presenting here is remarkably similar to identity theory. There is only one representation. It's a representation which is caused by our sensations. But there is a difference. In identity theory, there is no explanation of how that representation comes to be the object of awareness, how the contents encoded in our brain change from being merely intelligible to being understood, to being objects of awareness. It is the lack of any mechanism for awareness that is the critical weakness in identity theory. Long ago, Aristotle noted that there had to be some agency which took what was merely potential, namely intelligibility, and made it actually understood. He called this agency the agent intellect. 
obviously there is something which takes what is intelligible and makes it understood. It is our awareness. So awareness and the agent intellect are one and the same thing. Awareness is intentional. So it is the intentional subsystem in the mind. Now I'd like to discuss qualia and synesthesis for a bit. Qualia are the feels that our sensations have. When we look at something red, we have a sensation which we call redness, and that feel, the way redness appears to us internally, is the quale of red. The plural of quale is qualia. Sounds have their own distinctive qualia or feel. Colors have their feel and so on. Since neuroscience is completely unable to explain the existence of qualia, modern philosophers of mind often consider qualia to be a central issue. But the central issue in discussing mind is not qualia, but knowing. What qualia are, are the contingent forms of knowing. When we see red, it has to assume some distinctive form in order for us to differentiate it from other things that we see. And this contingent form is what we call redness. It really doesn't matter what the contingent form of redness is. It doesn't matter what the qualia are. When someone who has synesthesis sees a five and it appears to them to be red, they are able to tell by detailed examination that the five is not really red they can put it under a magnifying glass so that instead of seeing all of the five they only see a small portion and then they'll see the actual color in which it's printed so the fact that some people associate different qualia with the same object isn't really a problem what is problematic for materialists is their complete inability to explain how it is that we are aware of anything thank you for watching